Nymphomaniacs have always been around, there's no question about that. Thus, there's no one precise way to date the beginning of nymphomania in human history. But we're going to try to get as close to it as we can and explore how nymphomaniacs have been treated throughout the time. One thing's for sure, by the end of this video, you'll definitely know how to spot a nymphomaniac and what to do with her when you finally meet one. The concept of nymphomania, a term historically used to describe excessive sexual desire in women, is a relatively modern one, originating from the 18th century. However, an exploration of prehistoric societies reveals interesting aspects of sexual behavior and gender roles. In prehistoric times, the focus was primarily on survival and procreation. The concept of sexual desire as we understand it today did not exist in the same form. Sexual activity was likely more driven by biological instincts rather than personal desire or pleasure. The Venus figurines, small statues dating back to the Paleolithic era, provide some insight into prehistoric views on female sexuality. These figurines, found across Europe, Asia, and Africa, depict women with exaggerated sexual characteristics, suggesting a strong emphasis on fertility and reproduction. However, it is important to note that these artifacts do not necessarily indicate a prehistoric version of nymphomania, but may simply reflect the importance of fertility and procreation in these societies. It's important to consider the societal structures that existed, with most prehistoric societies being likely egalitarian, meaning there were no strict hierarchies or social classes, and this would have most probably extended to sexual relationships as well. The archaeological record provides some further evidence of prehistoric sexual behavior. Cave paintings and other forms of prehistoric art often depict sexual acts, suggesting that sex was a part of everyday life. With the evidence suggesting little to none references to nymphomaniac women in prehistoric times, I still have a gut feeling saying there's something there. Thus, we have to go deeper. The term nymphomania derives its roots from ancient Greek mythology, specifically from the nymphs, who were small goddesses associated with nature. The nymphs were known for their beauty and free-spirited nature, often portrayed as young maidens who loved to dance and sing. But these were gods, not humans. A simple Greek woman's sexual behavior was heavily regulated and controlled, and any inconsistency from the norm was said to be of a touch from the gods. Women were expected to be modest and take part in sexual activity as little as possible. Their excessive sexual desire was seen as a sign of moral weakness. This belief, combined with the medical theories, created a complex and often contradictory understanding of women's sexuality among Greek society. To be honest, the ancient Greeks' medical theories about nymphomania sound more like something from a horror movie, and that's why we definitely need to take a look at them. One theory that gained significant traction was the concept of the wandering womb. This theory, primarily attributed to the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates, stated that many of the health problems experienced by women, including being overly sexual, were due to a displaced uterus within the body. To cure a wandering womb, one was suggested to change their diet or take a bed rest. If that didn't help, more extreme measures were taken into use. For example, fumigation. Fumigation involved the application of foul-smelling substances to the nose and pleasant ones to the vagina to drive the womb back to its proper place. Yikes. Other treatments, suggested by the totally competent doctors of ancient Greece, included marriage and pregnancy. The wandering womb theory was so deeply ingrained in medical thought that it was still being taught in European medical schools as late as the 16th century. It was only with the progress of modern anatomy and the cutting open of human bodies that the theory began to be seriously questioned and eventually discarded from the medical realm. The ancient Greeks also believed in the concept of hysteria, a term derived from the Greek word for uterus. This was a medical condition believed to be exclusive to women caused by disturbances in the uterus. Symptoms of hysteria included faintness, nervousness, and most importantly, unusual sexual behavior. Someone should have just sent the ancient Greeks a copy of the Kama Sutra. Problem solved. By the way, Kama Sutra was most likely written in 225 AD. Go surprise your friend with a fun fact, if you have one. While ancient Greeks brought some clarity to the situation, it still feels like we need to dig deeper into the history of these magical silly beasts called nymphomaniacs. And what better place to explore next than the dark Middle Ages, where around every shady corner there might be some crazy humping going on. In the Middle Ages, the understanding of mental health was significantly different from today's perspective, and the understanding of nymphomania was heavily influenced by the works of ancient Greek and Roman physicians who believed that women's bodies were naturally colder and wetter than men's, making them more affected to certain conditions. For instance, they were thought to be more prone to conditions associated with excess cold and moisture, 
such as respiratory ailments, certain types of fever, and an excessive sexual arousal. This concept was rooted in the four humors theory, which proposed that the human body was composed of four basic substances, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. These substances were associated with the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water, and their balance was believed to determine a person's health and temperament. Women, according to this theory, were thought to be dominated by the colder and wetter humors, phlegm and black bile, resulting in their bodies being naturally colder and wetter. Physicians often prescribed treatments aimed at warming and drying the body, such as hot baths and certain herbal remedies. This belief, combined with the societal expectations of women's behavior, led to the creation of the nymphomania diagnosis. The treatment for nymphomania in the Middle Ages varied, with some physicians recommending marriage and regular sexual intercourse, while others suggested more extreme measures such as bloodletting or surgical interventions. But do not be fooled, nymphomania was not widely accepted in the Middle Ages, and the overly healthy bathtub treatments were only affordable to higher class. Lower class women who showed excessive sexual desire or behavior akin to what we would now classify as nymphomania were viewed with suspicion and often subjected to harsh punishments. The church, wielding significant influence over societal norms, considered such behavior as sinful and a threat to the moral fabric of society. The primary method of punishment was public shaming, a common practice in medieval times for various crimes. Women accused of excessive sexual behavior were often stripped naked and paraded through the streets, subjected to the mockery and ridicule of their community. This public humiliation served as a deterrent, discouraging others from engaging in similar behavior. In more severe cases, women were sent to asylums where they were subjected to brutal treatments. These included bloodletting, a common medical practice of the time, believed to balance the humors in the body, as mentioned before. The idea was to drain the patient of excess blood thought to be causing the hypersexuality. There was one more punishment for nymphomania in the Middle Ages, but honestly, I'm not even sure I can say what it is on YouTube, so let's just leave it at that. The diagnosis of nymphomania was not only a reflection of the medical understanding of the time, but also a tool for social control. The fear of public humiliation and brutal treatments led many women to suppress their sexual desires, contributing to a culture of repression and silence around female sexuality. The church's influence further reinforced these norms, associating sexual desire with sin and immorality. However, these practices did not go unchallenged. Some medieval texts, notably those by female mystics such as Marjorie Kemp and Julian of Norwich, subtly questioned the church's stance on female sexuality and suggested that women's sexual desires were not inherently sinful but could be a path to spiritual enlightenment. To which I say, Amen. And here's the most famous nymphomaniac from the Middle Ages, Marguerite de Bourgogne, a French queen whose reputation for sexual promiscuity led to her being one of the most well-known women of her time. Marguerite's life at the royal court was anything but ordinary. She was known for her beauty and charm, but also for her scandalous behavior. The queen's sexual appetite was said to be insatiable, leading to numerous affairs that shocked the court and the kingdom. Through her manners, Marguerite was able to get influence and control over many courtiers and nobles, thus securing her power at court. However, her sexual exploits did not go unnoticed. The queen's behavior was considered scandalous and immoral. Despite the societal norms and expectations of the time, Marguerite did not shy away from her desires. Everything was going smooth, until one day the queen got involved in the infamous Tour de Nessel affair. This scandal, which took place in 1314, involved the wives of the three sons of Philip IV of France, including Marguerite herself. The women were accused of adultery, with the charges being brought by their own husbands. The Tour de Nessel was a tower in Paris, where the queen and her sisters-in-law were said to have conducted their forbidden affairs. The accusations were based on the discovery of a purse containing tokens, which were believed to have been given to the women's lovers as a mark of their intimate relationships. Marguerite was accused of having an affair with a knight named Gauthier Donnet. The scandal was a significant event in the French royal court, leading to the execution of Donnet and his brother and the imprisonment of the accused women. The fallout from the Tour de Nezel affair was swift and brutal. Marguerite de Bourgogne was found guilty of adultery and sentenced to life imprisonment. Her royal status did not shield her from the harsh punishment sentenced out by the court. She was stripped of her title and privileges and imprisoned in the fortress of Chateau Gaillard, a formidable stronghold located in Normandy. Marguerite's life in prison was far from the luxurious existence she had once enjoyed as a queen. She was kept in harsh conditions with minimal comforts. Her once vibrant beauty faded and her health began to deteriorate. 
Marguerite's imprisonment lasted for a decade. In 1325, she met a tragic end, dying under mysterious circumstances. Some accounts suggest she was strangled to death, while others hint at a possible suicide. It might be a life story with a sad ending, but its true essence lies in joy. The legendary Queen of France carried on something beautiful, the never-ending spirit of nymphomania. And though one might say it's a curse, not a blessing, then I say it's always up for discussion. So let's dig deeper and see where the truth actually lies. By the 18th century, the term nymphomania was coined, as already mentioned twice, marking the medicalization of female sexual desire. It was a time when the medical field began to categorize and label various conditions, including those related to human sexuality. French physician Bienville, who came up with the term, described nymphomania as a female disease, characterized by an insatiable desire for sexual intercourse. He considered it a pathological condition, a deviation from what was deemed normal female sexual behavior. The diagnosis of nymphomania was not based on any concrete medical evidence, but rather on subjective observations and moral judgments. Symptoms for this sickness varied widely, from flirtatious behavior to a strong desire for sexual gratification, and even to reading novels, which were considered a corrupting influence to the woman's mind. The diagnosis itself was mainly used to control and pathologize women who did not conform to the societal expectations of modesty and passivity in sexual matters. It's important to note that the concept of nymphomania was deeply rooted in the societal context of the 18th century. This was a time when women's roles were largely confined to the home sphere, and their primary function was seen as bearers of children. Any expression of female sexual desire outside the bounds of marriage and procreation was viewed with suspicion and often shamed. The notion of nymphomania was not limited to the medical sphere, but affected popular culture as well. It was often portrayed in literature and art of the time, further reinforcing societal stereotypes about female sexuality. And born in 18th century, the most well-known nymphomaniac throughout history is said to be Russian Tsar Catherine the Great, who had so many lovers, she had to kill her husband to find time for them. She even had a secret room filled with genitalia-adorned furniture to take her partners to. One could even say she was the Russian Dorian Gray of 18th century. The diagnosis of nymphomania was further reinforced by the rise of psychiatry in the 19th century. Psychiatrists like Richard von Kraft Ebing and Sigmund Freud shamed female sexual desire, labeling it as hysteria or nymphomania. Freud, in particular, had many seriously weird theories about nymphomania among women, for example, the theory of penis envy. He proposed that during the psychosexual development stages, a young girl realizes she lacks the body parts only men have, leading to feelings of inferiority and jealousy towards males. Freud also introduced the term Electra complex to describe a girl's feelings of rivalry with her mother for the affection of her father. This, according to Freud, leads girls to nymphomania. It's important to note that these theories were met with criticism and controversy at the time, with many arguing that they reflected Freud's own biases rather than universal truths about female sexuality. One thing's for sure, Freud sure was a unique guy with some really weird theories. But the 19th century brought along many odd theories about nymphomania, including a breath of fresh air for the ladies who just can't keep it in their pants. But first, the medical theories. One influential theory was that of degeneration, which suggested that certain individuals and families were predisposed to mental and physical decline. This theory was often used to explain nymphomania, with women diagnosed with the condition seen as degenerate and a threat to social order. Another influential theory was that of neurasthenia, a condition characterized by nervous exhaustion and weakness. Many physicians believed that excessive sexual desire in women could lead to neurasthenia, further linking nymphomania to mental illness. But just when the ladies thought they'll never get a break, there appeared several critics who challenged the medical and societal understanding of female sexuality. Some physicians argued that nymphomania was not a disease but a natural variation in sexual desire. They pointed out that the concept was based on arbitrary and culturally specific norms, and that it was used to pathologize and control women's sexuality. These critics also pointed out the double standard in the way male and female sexuality were viewed. While women were diagnosed with nymphomania for displaying excessive sexual desire, men were rarely pathologized for similar behavior. This double standard reflected the gender norms of the time, which saw male sexuality as active and aggressive, and female sexuality as passive and submissive, leading to tensions between societal expectations and individual desires. Despite these criticisms, the concept of nymphomania remained influential throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th century. By the mid-20th century, the understanding of women's sexuality began to evolve. 
The Kinsey Reports, published in 1948 and 1953, challenged the common views on female sexuality, suggesting that women's sexual desires were far more varied and intense than previously believed. However, the term nymphomania continued to be used, often mockingly, to describe women with active sexual lives. The 1950s also saw a rise in the use of lobotomies to treat various psychiatric conditions, including nymphomania. This insane procedure, which involved damaging the frontal lobes of the brain by hammering a pick into it, was seen as a last resort for treating nymphomania, thank God. The practice was controversial and often led to severe physical and mental side effects. To think that only 70 years ago they were breaking open the heads of some of the most wonderful people on earth, legally, is a bummer. In the 1960s and 70s, the feminist movement began to challenge the concept of nymphomania. Feminist scholars argued that the term was used to pathologize women's sexuality and reinforce patriarchal control. They pointed out that there was no equivalent term for men, highlighting the double standards in societal attitudes towards male and female sexuality. Not really sure why there's a need for such word, but okay. In the late 20th century, the concept of nymphomania continued to evolve. The term was increasingly seen as outdated and sexist, and it was rarely used in medical or psychiatric contexts. It was seen as a relic of a time when women's sexuality was misunderstood and stigmatized. As we entered the 21st century, the term nymphomania had all but disappeared from medical and psychiatric literature. The 2000s saw significant advancements in the understanding of women's sexual health. The World Health Organization recognized that women's sexual health involves a positive approach to human sexuality and the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences. This was a far cry from the early 20th century when women's sexual desires were often viewed as a disorder. During this period, the field of sexology made significant strides in understanding female sexuality. Research highlighted the complexity and diversity of women's sexual desires, challenging the simplistic notions that had previously come up. The concept of nymphomania as a disease seemed increasingly out of place in this new understanding of women's sexuality. And now, let's see what nymphomania is known as in the year 2024. The medical specialists of today have replaced the term nymphomania by the term hypersexuality. Hypersexuality is characterized by excessive sexual thoughts or behaviors that interfere with a person's life, causing significant distress. The causes of hypersexuality are multifaceted. Biological factors such as hormonal imbalances or certain neurological conditions, for example, can lead to hypersexuality. Psychological factors, including mood disorders, substance abuse, and certain personality disorders can also cause hypersexuality. One common misconception is that hypersexuality is simply about having a high sex drive. However, it's much more complex than that. Hypersexuality involves a compulsive need for sexual activity that can lead to distress and impairment in daily life. It's not about enjoying sex, but about being unable to control sexual impulses. Another misconception is that hypersexuality is a choice. This can lead to blame and judgment towards individuals with the condition. However, hypersexuality is not a choice, but a complex interplay of biological, psychological, and social factors. These misconceptions can have serious consequences. They can prevent individuals from seeking help, exacerbate feelings of shame and guilt, and perpetuate harmful stereotypes. It's crucial to challenge these misconceptions and promote a more accurate and compassionate understanding of hypersexuality. These ladies must be embraced. Keep that in mind. It's important to note that today's doctors view hypersexuality as something that is not a moral failing or a character flaw, but a complex interplay of biological, psychological, and social factors that can have serious consequences if left untreated. It can lead to relationship problems, occupational difficulties, legal issues, and physical health risks. But still, if you research the web, they ask individuals experiencing hypersexuality to seek professional help. But after knowing all this, I'm afraid they're going to try to lobotomize me in a dark office corner somewhere. The treatment actually involves a combination of psychotherapy, medication, and self-help strategies. So go get help, you maniac. Be sure to watch all of our documentaries, which should appear on the screen just about now. There's only two on the screen, but you can find more from our channel page. Let us know which documentaries you want to see next in the comment section below, and be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. History, but fast.